special welcome from the cabinet of the Northern Illinois Conference of the United Methodist Church and a special greeting from our Bishop Sally Dick. On behalf of our Bishop and all of the cabinet members, we want to welcome you to this second 
online worship experience. We hope that no matter where you are, in a living room, on a porch, maybe even taking a walk uh, on a trail, or maybe for some of you at this time in a small gathering, social distanced, we hope that you find this to be a, a time to reflect and engage in the Word, to engage in the work of the Holy Spirit, that in these crazy, unprecedented times, you might find peace and hope, love and joy in what God offers in the workings of the Holy Spirit around each and every one of us. Welcome. We're glad you're here. Sing praises to God, O you saints, and give thanks to God's holy name. We exalt you, O God, for you have restored us to life. We may cry through the night, but your joy comes with the morning. You hear us, O God, and you are gracious in our distress. You turn our mourning into dancing. Our souls cannot be silent. O God, our Savior, we give thanks to you forever. At this time, we would like for you to prepare yourself to offer your tithes and offering for the ministry of your local church, our denomination, and our world. Let us pray. For the offering that we will receive in each church, may these gifts of time and talent and treasures be used for your glory, for your people, and for your ministry. Let each gift come from the heart as a gift that you give to them so they may give back to the communities and to the current conference and to the world in which they are served. Amen. No. 
it is time for us to pray. A time where we join together, a time where we lift up our prayers. My shirt says, fractured by life, healed by the spirit. There are so many times all of us have been fractured by life in one way or another. Fractured because of the sin, fractured because of racism, fractured because of sexism, fractured because of all kinds of things that we are not welcoming all, fractured because life sometimes can be unfair. We've been fractured by this COVID-19, which have killed thousands and thousands of people in the United States and our world. So we're praying, oh God, that you would heal this land by your Holy Spirit. Heal this land of the illness that is beseeching us. Heal this land of the racism that we have been dealing with. Heal this land of sexism. Heal this land of every other kind of ism in this world. Touch all of our churches, oh God. Touch each and every person under the sound of my voice that they would know that you love them, that you care for them, that you are wrapping them in your comfort and your care. God, we give you praise for who you are, praise for the way you love us, praise for the mercy that has been extended unto us. Yes, we are fractured by life, but we will be healed by the Spirit. I offer this prayer in the matchless and majestic and mighty name of Jesus the Christ. For we are one with each other. We are helping one another. And we go to God together as the body of Christ, as United Methodists, as people of God. In Jesus' name, amen. The first scripture lesson for today is in the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 6 to 9. The wolf will live with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion will feed together, and a little child will lead them. The cow and the bear will graze, their young will lie down together and a lion will eat straw like an ox. A nursing child will play over the snake's hole. Toddlers will reach right over the serpent's den. They won't harm or destroy anywhere on my holy mountain. The earth will surely be filled with the knowledge of the Lord, just as the waters covers the sea. Amen. Please join us for St. Francis' prayer. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let, let me sow love. Where there is injury, let me pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. 어둠이 있는 곳에 광명을, 슬픔 있는 곳에 기쁨을 심게 하소서. O oh, Divine Master, that I might not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born into eternal life. Amen. Hear now these words from Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. Finally. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of God's power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, 
and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Urgh. I didn't want to use the scripture. I tried umpteen times not to use this passage from Ephesians about the full armor of God because the images of an overly militarized police or police who use their power in unjust, anything but peacekeeping ways is so fresh in my mind and spirit. But then maybe we have a more visceral understanding of the majority of people in the first century toward the Roman soldiers. I tried to use other scriptures, but this one kept coming back to me. So please hear me out. Paul was using an image from the first century Roman soldiers to make a point about how to live as Christians in the midst of a hostile world. In some respects, he was defanging the terror of the soldiers, I think, as he took their various personal protection equipment and weapons and rebranded them into the soul protection equipment and practices that would provide an inner peace or deep peace and the spiritual power for Christians who lived in a hostile world then and now. If Paul were in ministry today, I think he would have used a totally different image to help us imagine how we can find deep peace in the midst of confusion and chaos, worry, threat, violence, loss, grief, and uncertainty. But it's the peace that God gives through the Holy Spirit and not as the world gives. Let me share the image I would like to imagine Paul using. Kathy Sullivan has accomplished two feats in her 66 years. She most recently became the first woman to reach a place called Challenger Deep. That's the deepest point on the surface of the Earth. It's nearly seven miles down from the surface of the Pacific Ocean. Prior to that, in 1984, she became the first American woman to walk in space. I love how she's reached the heights and depths of where we as humans have gone. But in both accomplishments, she couldn't venture defenseless against a hostile environment where she wouldn't have been able to breathe, where the pressure and other conditions would have destroyed her in seconds if she wasn't enclosed in a protective capsule. As she said in a recent interview, we human beings can create these vehicles that let us go to places that we otherwise have no business at all being. She then described how in her spacecraft and in her submersible, she was just inches away from that would prevent her from being able to live and move and do her work. These vehicles allowed her to peacefully exist, to walk, to be curious and useful, to use her words, in providing needed and helpful information and experience in her venture. We as Christians need soul protection and spiritual practices to surround us in order to meet and face all that can wound our souls and keep us from being able to be curious and useful in our daily lives. Otherwise, the confusion and uncertainty of these days will overwhelm us and keep us from living fully and abundantly in Christ. But we need to exercise our soul protection and spiritual practices. One of the strategic goals as an annual conference is to grow in our discipleship. The purpose of this goal is not to become, as I like to say, uber Christians, you know, those people trying to out God God as with their pious and self-righteous ways, like many of us 
who can be have grown up in the church, resting on our years of membership and service on committees, but not necessarily growing in our prayer lives or our submersion in scripture. Prayer and scripture, as well as the other means of grace, are those vehicles that take us places, the heights and the depths that are difficult for us to go. Places like forgiveness. Nothing says inner peace like forgiveness. Forgiveness in the place of hurt. Love in the place of hate. Trust in the place of suspicion and fear. Hope in the place of despair. And inspiration in the place of complacency. Are you building your vehicle of faith that allows you to live in peace, deep peace, no matter what is going on around you? As someone once said, peace, it doesn't mean there's no noise, trouble, or hard work. It means to be in the midst of those things and still be calm in your heart. Peace, deep peace. In addition to inner, or deep peace. There is the vision of peace in relationships around us, in our communities. Isaiah 11 provides the image where the wolf and the lamb, the leopard and the kid goat, the calf and the lion, the cow and the bear, they all exist together in perfect harmony. It's often called the peaceable kingdom. In one of my commentaries, it says that even nature demonstrates such peace. Are you kidding me? Evidently, that biblical scholar never read National Geographic. Nature does not abide in perfect harmony, all creatures naturally getting along. For the peaceable kingdom to occur, there would need to be some measures put into place for them to live together, as Isaiah envisioned. All creatures aren't equal in their needs when they're seeking to live together in harmony. Equality isn't enough to provide harmony or a peaceable kingdom. After Pentecost, for instance, it says at the end of the second chapter of Acts that the believers came together in unity and sharing. In fact, it says that the early community provided each according to their needs. Those early believers were from many different cultures and languages. They had to learn to live together in some form of peaceable kingdom. But over the next few chapters of Acts, we discover some of the ways that they provided for the needs of specific groups, such as those who felt they were getting shortchanged at the food pantry. Equality wasn't going to help. They needed to employ equity in order to live together in some form of harmony. I like the little meme that demonstrates so clearly the difference between equality and equity. Equality is about sameness. It focuses on making sure everybody gets the same thing. Equity is about fairness. It ensures that each person gets what each person needs. Acts 2 is talking about equity, not equality. For instance, a tall person, a medium-sized person, and a very short person are trying to peer over a fence. They are each given the same size box to stand on, no matter what their height. That's equality. The box comfortably puts the tall person over the top of the fence to see. In fact, it's more than enough. The box just barely gives the medium-sized person a view over the top. But the box doesn't get the short person anywhere close to being able to see over the top. That, my friends, is equality. Treat everyone the same. Give everyone the same size box, whether it accomplishes the goal to meet the needs of each of them or not. Instead, we need to think of equity. To give what each needs in order to live fully and abundantly in this world, in a peaceable kingdom where people have what they need in terms of a good education and health care and other essentials. Let's also say that to see over the fence means you have respect, acceptance, safety, care, and are heard. Some need more, some need different in order to accomplish health, opportunity, well-being, 
and justice. Let's bring it home. Think about the people around you, in your own family or household, in your church or community. What does a peaceable kingdom look like there? Even there we have our wolves and lambs, leopards and kid goats, or in other words, Republicans and Democrats, people who are LGBTQ and those who are straight, people of color and those who are white, young and old, patient and impatient for change. Now you have the realities of what is needed for a peaceable kingdom. What does each one need in order to see over the fence? How do we find out what others need? Isn't that the task of social holiness? Working toward a peaceable kingdom? When I said that the biblical scholar must, mustn't have read National Geographic because animals don't just live peaceably in nature, it's not totally true. There are some very unusual pairings of animals, domesticated and wild, who become inseparable in spite of their natural tendencies to be enemies. When you read about them, though, you find, you find out it's usually because of some extreme situation. An animal or bird was orphaned or hungry or fell out of the nest. And another animal who wouldn't naturally get along with the first one would rescue it, begin to groom it, make sure it was fed and cared for, and even nuzzle it a little bit. A mutuality of care and support begins to grow between them, as unlikely as it might seem each caring for the other in the specific ways that are needed. If we say we're in unprecedented times, extreme times, where people are hurting and suffering, couldn't we become a little bit more like the peaceable kingdom? Like those unlikely animals who do care for each other? More gracious, giving each other the benefit of the doubt, slow to anger, slow to judge? People are doing the best they can. Could we work a little harder to listen to what others need in order to live in that peaceable kingdom with them? You don't want to wear a mask, but others are concerned about their health. Give a little for the sake of God's kingdom. Maybe we all need to let go of a little of our pride and listen a little deeper. Once St. Francis tamed a wolf who was threatening a village simply by telling the village how to meet the wolf's needs. He got the village to feed the wolf instead of kill the wolf. It went contrary to the village's natural tendencies, but it worked. The village and the wolf became a peaceable kingdom. The peace that God gives is not like the peace that the world gives in the peaceable kingdom. What seems contrary to you and living with your natural en enemies or ideologies or differences of any kind may in fact be the key to a peaceable kingdom. A peaceable kingdom begins with each one of us. I encourage you to pray this simple prayer each day this summer. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace.
The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. 성부와 성자와 성령님의 놀라우신 축복이 함께 하시옵기를 간절히 축원하옵나이다. 아멘.